Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Friday Town Hall, our role in ending systemic and internal racism. Uh, we have been meeting for a number of weeks and probably months at this point and been led through a guided uh, study and dis discussion as well as uh, a process of reflection and learning. Uh, so thank you so much for joining in this continued conversation. We appreciate everyone being here. I would also like to introduce, so my name is Kathy Leach on behalf of the IMC Monastery Foundation. I'll host today and I am joined by several of my colleagues and uh, board members. So I have Jonathan Wolf with us, uh, IMC board member and con senior consultant with the Monastery Foundation. I also have with us Kitty Bravo, who we're saying a belated happy birthday to. Uh, Kitty is the uh, Director of Education for the Center of Guided Montessori Studies, as well as an IMC board member. Um, additionally, we have with us Tim Selden, as we usually do, Chair of the IMC and President of the Montessori Foundation. We are going to be, uh, let's see, we also have with us Sarah Lavalli, who has been um, working with us and making sure that we have videos and uh, slide presentations and all kinds of things. She is the uh, Director of Social Justice at A uh, Child Unique um, in Alameda, California. And then our, our, um, our leader and our uh, pretty much our Director of Learning, I think our, our guide <laughs> in this process has been Dr. Cindy Acker, and Cindy will again lead us today. Cindy, thank you so much for being with us and for all of the work in uh, guiding us through this process. We've so appreciated it. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon. Um, we're going to start as we usually do with a moment of silence and reflection, but we're gonna do it a little differently because I have something that Sarah is going to be showing a portion of and I, I'd like you to watch and for that to be your moment of silence. First they stole our body, I can't cry no more. then they stole our sons, I can't cry no more. then they stole our God, I can't cry no more. and gave us a new one. I can't cry no more. Then they stole our beauty, I can't cry no more. the comfort in our skins, I can't cry no more. then they gave us duty, I can't cry no more. and then they gave us sin. I can't cry no more. And then came generations I no that helped to build this land. I can't no more. The bedrock of a nation no was laid with these brown hands. I can't no more. The solace of a people I can't no more. was found with that new God. I can't no more. And many peaceful steeples no more. would guard the road we trod. Then they stole our solace, no and then they stole our peace. No with countless acts of malice no and hatred without cease. No A foul and dirty river no runs through this sacred land. No with every act of terror, no they tell us where we stand. 500 years of poison, I can't cry no more. 500 years of grief, I can't cry no more. 500 years of reason, I can't cry no more. to weep with disbelief. I can't cry no more. The legacy is mighty, we can't, cry no more. we can't carry this alone. We can't cry no more. You have to help us fight it, we can't cry no more. and together we'll be home. We can't cry no more.
Está ótimo. So I'm curious whether or not anyone who was here last week, um, we did information about race as a social construct. I'm curious if it brought up anything for you or any thoughts that you had. And if you were not here last week and you're just joining us, um, just if there's anything that came up for you from what you just saw or just has just been in your body and needs to get out. would like to remind everyone if you'd like to raise your virtual hand, but right now we're a small enough group that if you just want to unmute, feel free to comment and we can have a conversation with this size group. So um, I'll be watching for hands up, but please feel free to unmute. Hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted, I just responding and taking another class in um, religion, education, and democracy. And the, one of the books we're reading is Between Church and State, Religion and Public Education in a Multicultural America. And the, the whole the idea and what we're learning about by going back through the history of the United States and public education has a lot to do with the Protestant impact and that that's what determined uh, much of who our public schools are, what our public schools are. And it struck me that in the video that we just watched, um, so many of the individuals that are in it from various different groups of people were, and their, their, their ancestors have been forced to sort of live up to the codes that the, the Protestant um, white, you know, power people had set up uh, at the beginning of our country and through a couple hundred years. and. We're just at a point now where we're starting to recognize that and be mindful of it, um, aware of it, and how we need to be open to changing things to and be inclusive of more voices. Yes, we are a colonized people who have colonized people. Sarah? I, uh, as I was watching the video just now, I, I reflected on my, my assumption that everyone who looked white was white. Mm. And I and the the one drop passed through my mind, and I thought, I don't know who their grandmother is, who their grandfather is, who their, you know, uh, I have no idea. I'm making an assumption based on seeing skin color and hair color and eye color, and I thought that that's that's the that's the construct, right? And that if I could, it, it, that's the construct that's been built. If I can, if I can apply that pigeonhole, I do, automatically I did. And then I realized it didn't apply. Okay, anyone else? So what did you learn last week that told you that race was a social construct? I want everybody to just try to think about what did you, what did you hear? Any bit of information that you heard last week about the history of race that tells you that it was created? I think for me, um, Cindy, what, what Sarah just referred to, the, the one drop rule and how the, these rules um, changed over time to suit the needs and to sort of um, create those constructs that, that were needed, including the migration charts that you showed and the, the things that, that helped us see that it, it served the dominant culture at one time. And so it became a construct according to that. And then that, as that, those needs shifted of the white majority or the white domination shifted the needs, then they just shifted the rules to continue to protect the construct that they were creating. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? How it um, is fueled by greed, you know, the, the, um, 
we had to justify that these people were lesser than because we needed their labor. And so somebody could make money. Yes. And, and how did we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Please. I was just gonna say, and that still continues. And the piece of power plays in that. I think that uh, the experience of, of needing to hold on to power and feeling like that's a zero sum game. If I have power, you can't. There's not, there's, there was nothing, no allowance made for co-creating something for sharing power. Yes. Anyone else? So I wanna start by having you listen to a piece um, by Randall Robinson. And um, if you haven't ever read his book, it's called The Debt. Um, the entire title is The Debt, What America Owes to Blacks. Um, and I believe he's also a part of the, um, one of the reparations committees that exists around the nation. Um, there's some in the US and there's um, some in other countries. Um, but Sarah, can you, pull up and, and his full video is, is uh, quite something. This is just a little piece of it. I got to Harvard Law School. I was 26 years old. It was the first time I had ever sat in a classroom next to a white American. And I remembered being impressed about how wealthy the school was. Harvard is the oldest university in America, established in 1636. And it has become extraordinarily rich. It has an endowment now in excess of $20 billion. And I recall sitting in class, poor child from the South, seeing these oil paintings above the wainscoted, rich hardwood rooms of old, bewigged white men from the 17th and 18th century. And one was awed by it. This is Harvard. Thirty years would go by before I was to learn that Harvard Law School was established and made possible by a man named Isaac Royale, who endowed the law school from the proceeds he had gotten from the sale of slaves on his Antiguan sugar plantation. Our forebears, with their appropriated labor, endowed Harvard Law School. Brown University is a very prestigious Ivy League school in the United States. The Brown brothers made their fortune building and sailing slave ships. They established a bank in Providence, Rhode Island that was to become Fleet Bank, one of the largest in the United States. So much of America's institutional wealth has its roots in slavery. Aetna Life Insurance Company, the same story. The early buildings of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. were constructed with slave labor by slaves from Louisiana 
who were labor sold to a plantation in another place. They were never paid. The United States Capitol. I remembered when I used to work there. And I walked through the rotunda time and time again. And I never looked up. And I remembered one day when I was writing, defending the spirit, I went down to the Washington Mall, walked up and down the mall with my daughter, Kalia, when she was just a little girl. And we were in the rotunda, and around the, around the wall of the rotunda is a hat band, a kind of frieze that depicts American history. And you will see everybody depicted in the frieze, except the people who built the capital of the United States. They were never paid. The stones were cut in Stafford, Virginia, and brought up the Potomac River by enslaved people. Atop the United States Capitol is a statue called, ironically, Freedom. It is a statue of an Indian maiden. It was made and cast in Bladensburg, Maryland by slaves. Broken into parts, brought to the Capitol, reassembled and hoisted to the top of the dome by our forebears. Until 1807, Britain, British businessmen, British merchants, British bankers, made unseemly sums of money from the slave trade. The royal family was largely financed by the slave trade. So much capital was accumulated by Britain from slavery that the Industrial Revolution, because of this in large part, was made possible. You know, I am always touched when I hear about that. Um, I, it just really hits me somewhere. In his words, Randall Robinson goes on to describe the use of blinders. I know everyone has seen those in movies on either side of a horse placed on the horse to keep them from being distracted by what's going on around them. Blinders, eliminated your sight on the right, eliminated your sight on the left, eliminated your sight from what is behind and even some things that were in front of you. And blinders were put on horses to make them more controllable. I mentioned before that this information that we've been learning about the origin of race has kept us all in deep ignorance. We haven't really known the true stories and there are so many, so many stories. And in this way, the individuals who constructed, socially constructed race have put blinders on the entire world. And it's a piece that I think is really important for us to understand when we think about race as a social construct. Um, as someone who is robbing a bank and who is really, really good at it, plans it out really well, sorts out all of the possible um, areas um, of construction of the building and how the alarm system goes in the whole nine yards so as to pull it off sight unseen um, 
So the, the entire group of people throughout the centuries who constructed and have continued to fabricate race have allowed us to be in that kind of ignorance where we've been wearing blinders. Blinders about the history of the largest crime in the history of the world. Blinders put on all of us. Blinders on white people who have limited white people to from being able to know and feel the horror of the crimes that have been committed in the world and limited them to place it all within the realm of normalcy because we didn't completely know what was going on. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Stepford Wives. There's Stepford Wives and then there's the newer version of Stepford Wives and then the return of the Stepford Wives. Um, it's a movie about a town where everything seemed to be fine and the women acted just so and they were just really perfect and they all looked really good and they all had dinner made and the dinner was all really good and they were really strong sexual creatures who were there to satisfy the men in the town and everything went along very pur purpose pur purposefully and perfectly and um, no one spoke about it. No one questioned that something could go wrong because they were all being sucked into this mindset that was in the rest of the town, like the Borg in Star Trek. And so they had blinders on them, um, which kept them from really paying attention to the crime that was being committed throughout this town. And to me, very similarly, um, blinders were also placed on African Americans, too. And I say that specifically because there were no blinders on the enslaved Africans, the initial enslaved Africans. They knew their customs. They knew what um, their continent was like. They knew the things that they were able to do. They knew their shared stories, which is a very strong part of African history, is that you you share stories throughout your family so that people keep them alive and they keep the spirits of the people who went before them alive. However, over time, the blinders were placed on African Americans, those descendants of those initial Africans, by silencing the stories, by making the actions invisible, by making the contributions of Africans and African Americans invisible by making their knowledge invisible, the knowledge that they carried, um, the knowledge of the enslaved Africans who in large part created America. And it's blinders that Robinson reminds us um, to keep a horse from seeing what is to the left, to the right, to the back or partly in front, to keep the horse more controllable that's what the structure of race did for African Americans, fueled by slavery, undergirded by false information. The structure of race permitted the birth of a nation, and that nation is America, by stealing the life and the identity of a people. And I would say it's a dual crime the worst crime is to strip a people of the story of who they are, um, limits on what they're allowed to know about themselves, um, to keep blacks controllable. Um, in, in the debate, the vice presidents were asked, and I wrote this down to share, the vice presidents were asked about the racist actions that have occurred, and one person responded to the actions, and the other person responded in part to the actions, but then focused on the riots and said how bad that was that someone lost their business. And I was sitting there and I was writing this and I thought, 
He's saying in part how bad it was that although those slaves were beaten for many years and those terrible things happened after that, and that there has been so much racism that has been going on, that they messed up their master's land. And that's really bad. Um, that was the thing that was really bad. They needed to have been more controlled. I mean, that's basically what I heard. But in that song that we were, we were listening to earlier, I can't cry no more. I thought, he didn't get that. He just didn't get that. And the example of the universities as spoken of by um, Mr. Robinson um, is such a clear example of controlling, of disallowing black people to see to the left or to the right, to the back or to the front because you remove their history. Can you imagine the little child of color in your classroom who's not doing well to be able to walk into the, United, the, the rotunda of the um, capital and to go in there and to look up and to, and to know that his ancestors built that? I mean, what an incredible, what an incredible gift that is to a child. But to not see anybody of color in there as though people of color were not at all a part of that history of America is just really unnecessary but it was a really wise crime by the people who constructed race. Because if you can't see your past, you can't see your future. If you know your past, you can start to build a future. And Robinson says, what you don't know can kill you. And that's what happened in history. We learned last week that Europeans enslaved the Irish and then they enslaved indigenous people in North America. They, they enslaved them first, but they didn't see the value in their work, in the things that they needed as they started to do other things, tobacco, and other kinds of stuff like that. And both the Irish and the indigenous people started to revolt and refuse to work and that didn't work for them either. But why Africans? Anybody have an idea? Why Africans? I don't know if you can see your eyes, but I see everyone going, hmm, hmm. Well, what we haven't clearly learned is that there are contributions of Africans that made them prime targets for slavery. Um, many people look at Africa as though it's a primitive continent, a primitive, primitive civilization, or was a very primitive civilization who didn't have a solid language, who learned their civilization from white people, learned how to eat, learned how to um, operate in society and learned how to contribute to society. But let's take, let's take one example of a contribution. And Sarah, if you can pull up the first slide on cataracts. Let's look at that. visual potential. So uh, the first documented types of cataract surgery date all the way back to the 8th century BC. And uh, there was a procedure called couching that uh, was documented in the continent of India and then later on spread to the Mediterranean and then to Europe and then Africa and Asia. And basically, um, there is a surgeon who in some cultures was also the barber. And he had an assistant. And the assistant was supposed to hold the head of the patient. Now, this is to remind you, at this time, there's no anesthesia. 
There's no discovery of bacteria. So um, these procedures were done without anesthesia and without antibiotics. But basically, the surgeon took a long curved needle, went through the edge of the cornea, went through the pupil, and just tried to knock the cataract out of sight. So knock the whole cataract out of the pupillary axis and let it fall back into the back of the eye. Okay, let's bring us back out, Sarah. Sorry to talk to you about cataract surgery, but... <laughs> okay, so what did she say about it? Where did it come from? Anybody who was listening, where did she say? India? India. Yeah, it India. originated from India, and then, and then where else? Spread to the Mediterranean, Africa. Mm-hmm, okay. Sarah, can you show us the second one? So cataract surgery in antiquity, probably the father of cataract surgery, if you would, was an Indian surgeon named Sashruta. Back in the 6th century BC, he was the first known person in the record, basically, that thought that it would be okay to try to take the lens and push it out of the way. You can imagine kind of him sitting back at a fire with his friends, seeing someone with a cataract and saying, maybe if I take this big stick, I could push that out of the way. You can imagine, unfortunately, that while that did work, you got the, the area of clotting out of the way, it wasn't the best technique because although they saw pretty good for the short term, long term, they had lots of trouble with inflammation and sometimes even loss of the eye. There is also similar evidence in Iraq and Greece and Egypt of a similar procedure. And that continued until about 29 AD when the thought process changed to maybe we can actually just break up that cataract so people can kind of see around it. Okay, bring us back out. What did he say? Where did it originate? India. Uh, India again. India. And then where did it go? Egypt. Egypt. And before that? Greece. Greece. Greece and Egypt. Greece, yeah. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Sarah, bring up the third one. Cataracts have been around for as long as recorded history. This isn't something new. As far back as ancient Egypt, there's hieroglyphs of cataract surgery that was performed using sharp objects. Now, obviously the results were not great. You had to be desperate, but it was called couching. And this practice was brought up through even the Middle Ages. In some places in India, they still do it. Now, modern cataract surgery is nothing like that. As early as 1910, there were some physicians that were pioneering these types of interventions where the, you, the cloudy lens was removed. What did he say about Europe? Nothing. Anybody? Nothing. <laughs> if you do some of the deepest, broadest research about cataract surgery, what you will discover is that, yes, it, you, you did see um, that India was one of the um, beginnings of cataract surgery. But what happened is that in Egypt, and he said that you could see it in hieroglyphics, and in Egypt, that is where they started to look at the idea of what became, what has since become cataract surgery and to move it um, to, to as close as it could get from couching to actual cataract surgery. That, that step originated in Africa. And I'm sharing that as an example because there are many things that are similar to that, that had a beginning um, a scientific beginning, um, a, um, a complex industrial, closest thing to industrial beginning, the, the knowledge base 
a lot of that originated in Africa. And so it started to spread that there was a lot of knowledge, there was a lot of skill that could be attached to some really doggone good labor. And if you need to build a nation, the Africans are where you ought to go get those people and bring them over to be able to help. Because it's not just that they're gonna do your, your labor, which is what people assumed is what happened, but that they come over with an incredible intellectual skill base that we're not going to own. In fact, we're going to say that they're intellectually inferior, um, have a smaller brain, are not able to um, operate like the rest of humanity because they are not people, they're not human. Um, and so we should enslave them and make them do the work like oxen and camel. But the truth is that people started to know about the deep and wide knowledge base and skill set that was inherent within African communities. They had within them the ability to be able to start to create in Africa what was happening in, the, in America. And that's the reason why it became so important to bring Africans over. So to make this successful, it required a four-part kind of thing to happen. You had to get past the beginnings of the abolitionists. You had to get past those people who were going to come up against you and say that slavery was wrong. And in order to do that, you needed to dehumanize the people that you wanted to enslave. That's a little bit of what we talked about last week. And in order to do that well, to have enough buy-in for people, um, and it almost reminds me of what I just heard on the news about herd mentality and bringing scientists in to prove that. You go to, you find some scientists that are going to prove what it is that you want them to say. And in this case, what were some of the things that we heard last week that scientists said or that physicians said? Sarah, you, I think you're speaking, but you're muted. That the brain, that the brain was not as developed, an underdeveloped yes. brain. Yes. Which was the exact opposite of what the truth was. Yes, exactly, exactly. You find someone who people are going to listen to and you have them create a, a scenario or, or based on their own ideologies, what they have created and put together. You have them begin to publicize that so people buy into it because they will trust a scientist. They will trust a physician. They will trust a sociologist. Sociologists back then were very, very revered people. They'll, they'll trust them. And so you get their support so that people will look up to them and believe what it is that they say. And the, you hear what, what information they're giving you. And what they also said was because of all of these things that, we are, that we've learned and that we're sharing with you, it is justified that we recognize people in different categories, that we split them up into different races, and that we put the inferior people over here, and that we put the people who are um, highly not inferior over here, um, and, and that based on that, it gives us the right to be able to use the inferior people to be able to help the people who are more intellectual and capable and knowledgeable and more human to, to bring about the work that they need to have done and to reap the benefits of the work that needs to get done. That's one piece. The other piece is that you then legislate it. You make race law, you make in racism law, you make the ability to mistreat people law. And that's exactly what happened with slavery. 
with Jim Crow, with desegregation, with education. All of those things were legislated, which made it not only right in the minds of the scientists and the physicians and the people that they were listening to, who people looked up to, but in, in the eyes of the law, which sealed the rightness, if that makes any sense. That, and someone earlier used the word greed, that was greed masked as a step for survival. Um, I want to pause because I mentioned that um, that is also what occurred in education. And John, can you chat a little bit about yep. what happened with education? Okay. Um, Sarah, if you could <coughs> bring that PowerPoint up. <coughs> so Cindy asked me to do a little bit of a brief research on the history of race and the intelligence controversy. So I went to, I went to, you know, the big store, Wikipedia. And just a couple slides here of what was on Wikipedia in the, in the summary. The history of race and intelligence controversy concerns the historical development of a debate about possible explanations of group differences encountered in the study of race and intelligence. Sarah? And this is sort of the very brief history in a nutshell. Uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, group differences in intelligence were assumed to be racial in nature. Apart from intelligence tests, research relied on measurements such as brain size, which we've talked about, or reaction times. By the mid-1940s, most psychologists had adopted the view that environmental and cultural factors predominated. But then again, in the mid-1960s, physicist William Shockley, why a physicist, sparked controversy about claiming there to be genetic reasons that black people in the United States tended to score lower on IQ tests than white people. Sarah? And in 1969, the educational psychologist Arthur Jensen published a long article with the suggestion that compensatory education had failed that, to that date because of genetic group differences and then the book, The Bell Curve, a similar debate among academics followed the publication in 1994 of The Bell Curve by Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray. Their book prompted a renewal of the debate on the issue. And then we get into more contemporary. One contemporary response was the report from the American Psychology Association that found absolutely no conclusive explanation for the observed differences between average IQ scores and racial groups. And then lastly, in 2018, the neuroscientist Kevin Mitchell made this statement uh, in several publications. While genetic variation may ex help explain why one person is intellig more intelligent than another, there are unlikely to be stable and s systematic genetic differences that make one population more intelligent than the next, which led me to think about the really big issue, which is the last slide. You know, defining and determining intelligence along the narrow parameters of culturally based and biased metrics like IQ tests is like defining the beauty of a rose solely according to its color, ignoring its fragrance, shape, size, texture, resilience, and density of petals. Some of the books that I've been reading, and I can't remember which one cited this, is like when you define intelligence along very logical linear parameters, you forget that enormous numbers of indigenous peoples around the world have all sorts of other intelligences that uh, white European culture has never thought of, whether you call it intuition or holistic thinking or a sixth sense. And, you know, it's, it's defining intelligence according to just that, that white narrow parameter, it does an enor enormous disservice to everyone. Oh, Cindy, you're muted. I don't know how that happened. There you go. Uh, I, I became muted because our upper elementary children came in to share something. With them. <laughs> um, we tell them we said hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Sarah, if you can give me the pages for the play. I wrote a play, um, and I may have mentioned this before, I think now it's two years ago, something like that, um, that has to do with the history of desegregation in America. And um, it was performed, oh, on Juneteenth, year before last. Um, and it was supposed to be performed three times this year, except COVID happened. Um, but I want to read you a couple pieces. Sarah, do you have it? Yes, I sent it to you. I texted you the page number. 32 is the first one. OK. Um, I want to read you a piece. Um, and this part is, these are the actual words of Thurgood Marshall. And he's, I think this was the first court case um, for desegregation of schools. And I'll read it as he would have said it. I got the feeling on hearing the discussion yesterday that when you put a white child in a school with a whole lot of colored children, the child would fall apart or something. Everybody knows that is not true. Those same kids in Virginia and South Carolina, and I have seen them do it, they play in the streets together. They play on their farms together. They go down the road together. They separate to go to school. They come out of school and play ball together. They have to be separated in school. There's some magic to it. You can have them voting together. You can have them not restricted because of law in the houses they live in. You can have them going to the same state university and the same college. But if they go to elementary and high school, the world will fall apart. And the other part, Page 68. Is what page? 60, oh, 68. He says, there must be some reason which gives the state the right to make a classification that they can make in regard to nothing else in regard to Negroes. And we submit the only way to arrive at that decision is to find that for some reason, Negroes are inferior to all other human beings. Nobody will stand in the court and urge that. And in order to arrive at the decision that they want us to arrive at, there would have to be some recognition of why of all the multitudinous groups of people in this country, you have to single out Negroes and give them separate treatment. It can't be because of slavery in the past because there are very few groups in this country that haven't had slavery somewhere back in history of their groups. It can't be color because there are Negroes as white as the drifted snow with blue eyes and they are just as segregated as the colored ones. Those were the words of Thurgood Marshall in the very first case against uh, desegregation of schools, and they lost. They lost that case. It took many more cases before Brown versus the Board of Education actually ended up resulting in desegregating schools and um, even then, people close down their schools as opposed to desegregating. And to, as of last year, there were still schools that were desegregating. Se segregated. I'm sorry, yes, there were schools that were still segregated in California. And so it is amazing that what happened with this 
construction of race, it wasn't that the educator said, oh no, this is a disservice to the children of color, let's do something different. Educators fell right into it. They drank the Kool-Aid, they became a part of all of what continued to happen. And so when I mentioned those things that were required, the dehumanization of people, getting the support from other individuals, legislation, um, convincing people that it was a part of their own sustainability, which equaled greed, that they needed to be able to, to ensure that this continued. Then there is what I call dehumanization two, that you strip a people of their language, their history, their family, and that's how people of color became invisible, not invisible as slaves, but invisible as contributors, invisible as intellectuals, invisible as people who, who had incredible um, medical ability when it com came to um, organic ways of treating the body, that all of that became invisible and 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 as though it never ever occurred and then separated them out by race and stripped them of all of their humanity that's why race was constructed because it benefited people to create the America that many of us live in. So what do we do to dismantle that? Can you, can you change something that's been constructed? Karen, you're shaking your head. What do you think about that? Yes. Um, just a minute. Oops. I have something at the end of my table here. My bed. <laughs> uh, when I was teaching the humanities at the Montessori school that I worked in, um, I had found this quote, and it was at the Academy of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. My husband works at the Extension School at Harvard. And this quote says, each stage of human civilization is defined by our mental structures, by the concepts that we create and then project upon the universe. They not only re-describe the universe, but also, in so doing, modify it, both for our own time and for subsequent generations. And it's by Edwin Land, the Polaroid camera guy. Um, 1979 at the dedication speech of the new building. And when I read that, I was like, oh my God, this is what I'm going to use as the theme for humanities. <laughs> and so we're always creating new concepts and new mental structures and new ways of looking at worlds, etc. And um, so the part, what we did is the kids would then start creating new stories. For, humans, for humanity, based on the studies that we did of many different cultures, many different traditions, gaining and looking at the wisdom from many different parts of the world um, and using their imaginations to put it together. And so, of course, I mean, everything has changed. I mean, we women now have the vote, <laughs> um, right? So it's, it's always changing. And so just, uh, and that's very, positive and you know we can we can make make it a, a new kind of adventure in the future yes <laughs> yes um i have a teacher who um was on paternity leave and he is just back this this week and um i was in the classroom when he was explaining to the children um why he took eight days to name his son and he said, the nurses came in and they asked, and he said, I just really don't know yet. Um, and he said that he and his wife decided that um, they wanted to, 
they wanted to be the ones who would purposefully make a decision around the inheritance that they were sharing with their son and the information that they were going to bring forward with their son and that they were going to start by not carrying forward the European last name that they held. Um, and so he has a completely different first, middle, and last name than his two parents. Um, all three names are African names um, that they gave to their son. And I had to stop for a minute because part of me wanted to say, well, no, no, no. I mean, he's supposed to have one of your last names or something like that. And he said, I decided that it needed to stop here. Um, we, we decided it needed to stop here. And that um, forever would people be questioning his name and forever would that be a reminder for us of where his beginnings are. And I was quite impressed with that. Um, but it, it was his way of saying something will stop here and something new will take its place. And so I think that there are things that we have to continue to think about, like the quote that Karen mentioned. Karen, you should put that in the chat. Um, it's long, but um, that there, there are things that we can start to do. And I'm reminded of some little things that have occurred in education, like um, when the Americans with Disabilities Act was formed, that there was also um, a movement that was made to allow uh, children who had special needs to not be defined by their special need and that if they could be in a regular classroom with other children, that they be allowed to do so. And I, I thought about that recently because years and years ago, it was just a given that if you were a child with a disability, you were in the special needs classroom. It could be a physical disability, it could be an emotional disability, it could be an academic and um, intellectual disability, no matter what it was, it got you stuck into the room with all of the other children with a disability. And that, that time period when that piece of legislation came out changed that. Um, and I don't even think of it anymore. I don't think of children as automatically being in a special needs classroom anymore um, because of that. And they were, they were taken out of that, that bubble um, and not made to all automatically be assumed that they were in that little box because of their disability. And so if we can shift boxes, we can shift views. And if we can shift views, we can start to look at people differently. I think that every time Mike says something on this forum, people see him, they hear him, and it takes a moment to go, oh, that's a black man with an English accent. And, and to say, yes, it is. And, and he pushes, he, he pushes, people's boxes open, their mental models open, just because of who he is. And I think that that's part of the piece that we have to continue to do. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that and why we do, Sarah, can you put my link from Teaching Tolerance into the chat? What's coming up for everybody? You've been really quiet today. Mike's got his hand up, Kathy. Oh, please, Mike. Just go ahead and unmute. Yep. <laughs> so I was thinking about the beginning of this particular meeting and the things which, that were shared about the building of the Capitol. And I was, there is no doubt it's, it's proven historically, nobody's debating the fact that slavery existed and that, you know, that happened. There were a group of people who had nothing and who were brought here under duress or whatever the reasons are. Then, um, it, and now here we are today, okay? We, we have um, 
talk of people, the, these people or the generations further down the line, just not being as smart uh, for whatever reason. Okay. And um, what comes to mind is that we're brought here to do agricultural work, to do unindentured labor, um, to do things that were not easy. And when that became, uh, when, when it was not able to do that anymore, um, socially, those people were cast to the side, all right? And it seems like the passage of time has removed us from the cause, okay? Because obviously slavery existed. Now there's just a whole lot of inferior, not as smart people walking around in the world. So the marginalized back then have now become um, the problem. Okay, you follow what I'm saying? Like back then it was, um, there was a real reason, nobody doubted that. Now those, uh, the descendants and, and those people are a problem. Um, the enslaved back then, through the passage of time, have become irresponsible, right? So now we, back then it was, you were enslaved, you were a slave, you belonged, you were somebody's property. Things happened, history happened, and now we've come out of that. And now the descendants of these people just irresponsible. So I'll, I'll can what I'm trying to say. You know, for example, uh, Cindy mentioned the, the four steps. You know, that was part of that process in the passage of time that helped to take what was absolutely irrefutable. Uh, slaves existed, people were being used in horrendous ways, uh, disease, um, and now we have. Uh, and I'm not just speaking in broad strokes. This is, this is something that I've experienced, even as an immigrant coming here. Racism, it's, it, it happens um, and manifests itself, manifests itself in sneaky, subtle ways. And I, and I know there's nothing wrong with me. I'm, 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 a, I'm a relatively intelligent person, but I experience it. Um, I want to share something with you um, that kind of, uh, if you don't mind, please just give me one moment. It says, um, this, is, this is just like those four steps, convincing people of, of, of uh, you know, medical reasons and, 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 and taking away the, the validity of a people. I just want to read something real quickly. It says here, um, unfortunately, wealth in this country is unequally distributed by race and particularly between white and black households. African-American families have a fraction of the wealth of white families, leaving them more economically insecure, with far fewer opportunities for economic mobility. As the report, as, um, even after considering positive factors, such as increased education levels, African-Americans still have less wealth than whites. Less wealth translates into fewer opportunities for upward mobility and is compounded by the lower income levels and fewer chances to build wealth or pass the accumulated wealth down to future generations. Um, then it goes on, it says black households, for example, have far less access to tax advantage forms and savings uh, due in part to a long history of unemployment, discrimination and discriminatory practices. A well-documented history of mortgage, mortgage and market discrimination means that blacks are significantly less likely to be homeowners than whites which means they have less access to savings, tax benefits uh, that come with owning a home. Persistent labor market discrimination and segregation also force blacks into fewer, less um, advantage, uh, uh, advantageous um, employment opportunities than their white counterparts. Thus, African-Americans have less access to stable jobs, good wages and retirement benefits at their work all key drivers by which um, American families gain access to savings and other things of that nature. Moreover, under, I'm almost done. Moreover, under the current tax code, families with higher incomes receive increased tax incentives associated with both housing and retirement savings. Because African-Americans tend to have lower incomes, they inevitably receive fewer tax benefits. Even if they are homeowners, or have retirement savings accounts. The bottom line is that the persistent housing and labor market discrimination, job discrimination and segregation worsen and damage the cycle of inequality. So it's a vicious cycle. And um, I'm trying to say that while 
the, the, I know people who mean well. I know blacks and people of color who want to get out of their situation. They're educated, but the outcomes are different for them and it perpetuates the cycle. So the kids aren't as maybe motivated. I'm not just talking about two generations. I'm talking about five, six generations. Maybe the kids aren't as motivated. They don't get to um, be in the same circles as other people. Maybe an experience abroad might change them a little bit and make them go in a different direction. Maybe the ownership of something might make them feel it. The experiences are usually not the same. And the outcome is a diluted, and I say diluted, you know, on a curve there, is, a, is, 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 is an individual that is not able to realize their best life. And um, nobody's doing this deliberately. I, I know no, no, no people of color in, in large groups want to just be lazy or, 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 or go around underachieving. This is a systematic issue, in my, in my opinion, uh, primarily that uh, just begets generational issues over and over again. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Yes, and it was created, created with the knowledge of that, that that would exactly be what would occur. John. Yeah, uh, Mike, thank you. Um, what occurs to me is such a vicious cycle, what you're saying, when you have these systemic limiters that disenfranchise and disempower people, it feeds the, 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 the the dissolute, the, how is it? It feeds the delusional thinking of everybody else. Like white people go, see, you know, blacks can't hold high level jobs or blacks are not as intelligent or whatever. And of course, for, for, for people of color, they will have those illusions about themselves. So that kind of Absolutely. secret system that keeps feeding and limiting people really has a, uh, it keeps on recycling around the same misperceptions of the uh, lack of capacities and potential of people, which is really Absolutely. tragic. Yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts about that? Not specifically about that, but I'm going to speak for myself. I, um, I haven't really gotten beyond the opening. When I think about what we've witnessed in the last eight days, and I think back on what you and Sarah shared, for me, it was just, it was, it just stopped me in my tracks. Uh, and everything else has been only accumulating, but I just want to thank you. You live in a challenging time. I am, um, I spoke at, um, I was a keynote yesterday in the city of Alameda, and it was interesting because the one of the people who um, responded afterwards is a banker um, there. And he said, I have always lived in the city. I grew up, I went to school here, I never left. Um, I've only lived in another state for five days. I've literally never left this island. And he said, I, I, work at a bank, I have always worked at a bank, and it has never dawned on me that there are very few people of color who come into the bank. And he said, I haven't known any of the stories that people talk about, and I haven't really seen any of the people um, that people talk about, because I have lived my life very comfortably seeing the things that I want to see and experiencing the things that I want to experience. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, let me give you an, another measure of depth there, is that not only have you not seen many African-Americans in your bank, but there are many African-Americans who don't end up in the bank. They go to the check cashing place to cash their checks and they get money orders to pay their bills and have done that and their mothers and their mothers um, before them. Um, because they, they wouldn't have had enough money to hold in, into a savings account. And it was shocking news for him. He just never considered that that could even be the case. Yeah. Sarah? Um, I, I wanted to go back to something that is in the chat um, that Karen put in. Uh, she talked about progress at Harvard 
that uh, the dean of the uh, Faculty of Arts and Sciences is a, black, is a black woman and the dean of the Graduate School of Education is a black woman. And I think those are wonderful progresses, but I think they're all forward looking. And I, and I think one of the things that I hear in the conversation is about the importance of revealing the true history, the true contributions, the fact that 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 the enslaved people were were actually always brilliant. There was always a brilliant mind in there. It wasn't that this is new. It wasn't that um, there, there's a there's an advantage to looking forward and seeing the opportunities are there and seeing the growth. But I don't think our children can grow with only looking forward. They have they have to know if, if our our black children have to know that they have always come from brilliance and intelligence and ability and artistic capabilities and vision and uh, imagination, right? That, that the limiting was done to, to their ancestors, not the other way around. It, it, that population didn't grow out of it and, that, and because they had more opportunities, now they did better. It was the, you know, there's a, there's a truth to, the rea to, to our history that we have to just start revealing because I, there are many very, very brilliant black people who still don't know their own history. They, they came through the adversity, but just because you have black skin doesn't mean you know the truth, you know? And so it's, it's this, this is, we gotta pull back those onions, onion layers and put the history in the books and, and start talking about it really openly and actively and, co you know, constantly. Um, so that people can know it's it's always there's always been a deep history that has that blinders have been put on so that that people didn't see it, um, and it was not their fault that they didn't see it. They're not there's not a blame. It was a conscious effort to keep them ignorant. Um, so I, I I I appreciate all the the you know progress and we have to have more progress in the, re the revelation of the history. And contributions. Yeah, and I have to say I appreciate that there's progress. One person in a university the size of Harvard is a shame that there's only one black person. That's a shame. Um, oh, there's two? There's two. <laughs> oh, there's one more. Is that what you're saying, Karen? There are two, she said in her text. There's two. This is great. Um, I mean, Lovely to honor them. It's just not all that. There's a big movement going on where more women are becoming put, being, you know, put into positions of power, and that's impacting a lot of things. Um, it's impacting the intention, the goal, the vision of the universities, and um, that's good. Like I'm in the social justice uh, cap or part. Um, uh, program at the Extension School and a m number of women at the Divinity School at Harvard are very social justice oriented and getting people to do projects and learning about, you know, how do you impact your community? Um, so, so that is happening, at least in that little corner of the world. <laughs> That's good. Um, if you look up Fortune 500 companies, you will discover that there are four, four people at the top who are Black. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those companies is Lowe's, believe it or not. Um, but four, that's, that's a shame. Your Jonathan, hands up and then to Arlette. Oh, John, you're muted. Thanks, Kathy. Um, uh, Sarah, thank you for saying what you said about the importance of, of knowing the stories of the past, both the collective and, and the individual. You know, it, if you look at the principles of uh, design thinking, innovative thinking, it starts, you can't get people motivated to rethink until they go through the door of empathy. You know, in design thinking, it's let's go really find out what the customer's story is, what, what, what their actual experience is, and then we can design some new systems or new services for them. So I think if we're trying to change people's hearts and minds, we can't just ask them to go change policy systems, institutions. We have to have them understand the collective history and the personal stories of people. It's kind of like the principle of restorative justice. 
where a sociopath who's in jail actually changes their heart and their consciousness because they've heard the story from the victim's family. So I think, Sarah, your point is so right on. And it, it can then lead to systemic and innovative change. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, you were talking about knowing your history. And what came to mind for me um, was just basically coming from South America, Guyana, um, the only English speaking country um, in South America and coming to America. And, you know, for me, I'm a West Indian American. I'm not African American. And um, so with that, I think I haven't really experienced or, or at least just growing up and experiencing just the history here, you know, of African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been a distinction for me and I kind of kept my business to my business, meaning that, you know, I'm West Indian American. And there was a definitely a separation for me. Um, and so now I, I, I see a whole lot, just my responsibility as it comes to knowing um, the history and also being responsible for the children that I teach, um, being able to help them as well, because it, 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 it just, it's like that. I, I think being black, you know, I try not to be black uh, simply because, you know, sometimes some people are too black. And when I say that, I mean, you know, uh, just with the African wearing clothing, the sisterhood. And, and so I pretty much, you know, have pulled away from that and uh, just trying to navigate, trying not to be discriminated against, trying not to be put in a group or whatever. So it, it's been very hard um, for myself, but I, I think just learning, you know, just where we are Blacks, you know, collectively and learning my responsibility and, and seeing what I can do. I, I think that uh, I'm really encouraged, uh, honestly, to even be part of this group, Cindy, um, you leading this meeting every uh, Friday and with everybody else, just the contribution and the support, I, I really am, I really feel responsible. And, and to know that I have to step forward and, and make a difference, that I can be that black woman here or there or whatever, because I think also we have a responsibility, me being black, to, to make a mark, you know, to lead the way for other kids like me, to show them, you know, an example of what it means to, to be a, a whatever, fill in the blank. So that's all I want to share. We do, and I think it's so amazing to, to, to the reminder that every black person isn't a black American. That that's, mm -hmm. again, that's, that, that's not your experience, that's not your history. Um, and and that's, that's cool, that's, that's eye-opening. That's you know, making people aware that everyone has, their, has a history of, that's, that you can't make assumptions about. Or they may be Black Americans, but they may not be African Americans. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what I mean. Cheryl, I think you had your hand up. Did you want to comment? Yes, it's kind of a different thing as we've been talking about schools and everything. I um, have, I'm lucky to have friends who share their own stories with me that are so different than mine, and um, and this is made me think about something one of my friends is going through, um, that he went to um, University of Virginia. And I had always known that he had a tough time there because a lot of people felt like he was only, he only got in because of, um, because of his skin color and, um, and definitely wasn't true. And he has recently, I guess in work that UVA is doing, discovered that his ancestors actually built UVA mm. as slaves. They, they built it. So now he's reliving that past with a different view and, um, and trying to look at how, how that affects his children. So um, as we're, it, it's an, in, a, one person who I've known for a long time looking at their past and their future, their family's past and future that they're just finding out about. And so this conversation, we'll have a conversation this weekend, T and I, 
um, about what we've talked about here because it's, um, I think it would be helpful. I think it would be helpful to him and it's helpful to me to, um, to hear it and to see the struggle and, um, and to then get the more um, kind of academic perspective that I feel like this conversation is both the personal and the academic. So yes, thank you and, um, and to share that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting when you flip that the other way around and you ask yourself, what, what, what would it be like if Norman Rockwell never was Norman Rockwell. You know, that nobody knew, nobody knew that he was who he was and um, that there were these artistic pieces, but someone else claimed um, their, their, their name and, and their creativity. And um, that's basically what's happened with all of America. I mean, if you suddenly could turn and put the faces to all of the architects and all of the designers and all of the um, people who built the universities and, and the rotunda and the White House, et cetera, et cetera, wouldn't that be just amazing? Um, yeah. Just amazing. So Cindy, is this, um, is this focus that we've had over these past couple of weeks um, you know, on how this is such a social construct and, and how we got here. And, and a lot of this is, you know, I, I certainly recognize systemic racism, but I don't think I understand this under, fully understood the social construct um, as I am beginning to grasp. Is this what leads to um, a conversation about reparations? Well, I think it does for many people. I mean, um, uh, Dr. Robinson, who we started off with, um, it is a major part um, for him. And, um, and it's interesting because when you read his book and you look at some of the work that he has done, he says, you know, it's, it's not even a matter of money because you'd be in the trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, but it's, it's what you do to give back an identity to a people and, um, and that there are so many other measurements that we have to look at. Um, and I also frankly think that that idea, and I, I voiced a little bit of that last week, that idea I think is a piece that really scares people to death and why they don't want to go there because they're, they're, they're fearful of what that will mean to what they have. Um, and what they know, it's like um, just a, a little piece is, um, and I've spoken to this before, is, is where people are renaming things. Um, in Alameda, I mentioned that there was a park that is being renamed right now. It's called The Park because they don't know what to name it. And so, so it has no name. Um, how, and and I'm, just, I'm just shocked at why people wouldn't, if you're going to change a name, then pull from the history of the people of color and, and you've got, well, you have a name. Why are you struggling to find a name? There are tons, tons of people of color who have been the backbone of this nation. So why are we struggling with that? Um, well, part, part of the reason I, this is why I asked the question and I think that, you know, we, we walk around it a little bit, we talk around it a little bit um, and you know, I, I wasn't sure where it fit in, but I, now I'm sort of seeing a correlation from where we have been and where we're going, what we're talking about now. And I, I do see it as a fear. And it comes back to, I think, you know, uh, that, that scarcity mentality that if I give to you, I have less. Um, and the fear that this will be such a systemic and societal change that my life will no longer be the privilege that it is. Yes. I think the scary conversation is a, a necessary conversation. But again, it's part of the, you know, I, I don't know enough to say, oh, this is the conversation. I only know enough to say, are we there yet? Yeah, we, we need to be if we aren't. We need to get there if we aren't. 
And I, and I will say that I think that reparations come in all shapes and sizes. And I think giving, giving children back the history of all peoples, you yeah. know, the white children in the classroom as well as the black children, they all need to know the real history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, a, that's a, a repair that can be done without, um, without financial, books will cost money, but I mean, it's not about taking away from anybody and it's a gift to all of them. It's yeah. a gift to all children. To give but Sarah, back. I, the pushback I get, so I understand it's not just about money. I, I certainly <clears> understand <throat> that. I don't, I'm not saying that, but I, I think that, that people are afraid of that as well. They're afraid that their history is being taken away and replaced by real history. And so, you know, what there, there, there is a grief of the loss of what we believed in and what we thought was so. And I, I, I just think, I mean, I, I do hear this regularly, I think, because I'm, you know, we're doing this, right? So I get pushed back and I, and I'm curious, I listen and I, and I try to understand where people are coming from. And part of that pushback is about changing curriculum. Part of that is about um, having more black educators in our Montessori classroom. And part of it is about taking part in things like this, that open conversations and, and um, change our minds. So, is it, you know, the, there's fear of change and there, there's fear of having something taken away from us. Kathy, yes. I'm, I'm wondering whether there's actually a third psychological speed bump in addition to, I'm going to lose money or not make money or I'm going to lose my culture. Just the psychological speed bump of this is and was wrong. Right. I don't want to admit any guilt. <laughs> admit that this was wrong and this continues to be wrong. That's a speed bump for a lot of people. It's like turning the mirror yeah. and saying, this is wrong. Yeah. Harry, go ahead. And I wonder what we could do. I see this as more of making amends and what we can do as goals right now in classrooms, looking at that curriculum especially in the cosmic curriculum, anything in the cultural areas, uh, literature, what are we doing? What could we do in the next week to make a difference? You I know, think what are goals? What are goals that we could do, Cindy? I think that we can, we can start changing curriculum immediately and to share it. And I probably should have thought, Sarah, probably in your email, you have something that I sent to you about indigenous people. Uh -huh, from one of the parents? Uh, yes. Yep. And um, I don't know if you can put the link in, in the chat, but it's information that was created about Indigenous people by Indigenous people. And um, it was interesting because when the parent shared it with me, she said, you know, it's a whole lot. It's just a lot, a lot of information and maybe teachers won't want all of that. And I thought these were people who really wanted to talk about who they are. Um, and so let's take the lot and let's, let's go through that and let's share that with the children. Um, and so I think that we can, we can start to do that. I think that we can start to, to get rid of our books and put in, um, books about people of color. I think that we can, rather than naming classrooms after somebody who gave you a million dollars, why not name classrooms after some people of color and put the history on the wall of the, of the room so that every time somebody comes into oh, yeah. a room, they actually have to learn something about someone who is not George Washington Carver um, and, and not uh, Harriet Tubman as though they're the only two African-Americans who made, made uh, contributions to, to America, but other people and, and to put it up. Um, I can remember one of the greatest disservices many years ago is that when I started my school, I wanted to put a section that I dedicated to my father. And someone asked me, um, what did he do? And what college did he graduate from? And there wasn't, I couldn't give that as an answer. And I backed down from doing it because my father was illiterate. He didn't go past sixth grade. Um, and never read and the only thing that he could write was his name, that was it. Um, but he was someone 
who made a contribution because he made it. He migrated from, to, to get out of um, Kansas where, where blacks couldn't go to school um, with whites and migrated to the West so that he could, he could start a foundation for his children um, to be able to, to be in schools that were desegregated and to, um, to allow them to be able to get as far as they could. And he had his own business. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't send out the bills, but he did the cleaning. Um, and so it's, it's like, wait a minute. It, we have to switch up what we have considered to be worthy and respectful and acceptable um, because he was a black man who made it in America despite the racism that he grew up with. And that's enough, that's enough. Um, we need to rethink how we view what's, what's a successful black person. Um, and we need to start educating people about them and about who they are. Um, and we can do that on stones in our schools, on rooms in our schools. You know, we, we can do that um, and have moments where people walk around and they, they read and they learn and we can switch it up. Children who, we have older children who have lockers. We can put, we can name their lockers and challenge them to find out about the, the person that is on their locker, live up to some quality um, that is connected to that individual. Cindy, thank you so much. We are once again at the end of our time together and it, it always seems to go so fast and never seems to be enough. Um, but I think that's because we're all inspired and hungry for more and uh, looking forward to what we can do next. I, I wanna thank everyone who's been here today, who takes time out of their schedule, whether this is your first time or you've been here for every, every meeting, your commitment is important. Uh, to the future for the Montessori community. So I appreciate that. And all of our um, IMC board members and Montessori Foundation uh, friends that are here, we appreciate that. Sarah and Cindy, thank you again. Cindy, is there any um, direction we want to go next week or we want to talk about that and then put something on it? Next week, we are going to talk about when white is not the color white. And so we are, we're going to chat a little bit about how comfortable white people have gotten with just being white. And that once you discover actually what your, where you came from, um, it may make you a lot more understanding of people of color because you may discover that you are one. So that's, that's what we're gonna talk about next week. Um, I also want to show this because I want you to understand the importance of voting, if you can, and the importance of assisting an equitable, honest, fair voting process if you are not someone who can vote. Um, that it's just important to do that. Um, yeah, and absolutely. <laughs> we'll um, second that. Everyone vote. Yes, absolutely second that. Um, um, and, and if you've not registered for the I was just going to say that. <laughs> please, I was just going to uh, say that. Yep. If you've not registered for the upcoming conference, <clears throat> uh, please go to our Montessori.org website. You'll be able to click there for registration information. You can always uh, email me directly at Kathy Leach at Montessori.org if you'd like further information. I'm going to put this is our typical um, Hyatt background that I'm sitting in. We would normally be in the, at the Hyatt Regency in Sarasota, Florida. We will be broadcasting live from the Hyatt, from California, from Washington, D.C., and from many other locations throughout the world. So we hope that you can all join us for a live broadcast. Recordings will be available. CEUs are available. Uh, it's going to be a great time. And you know that the IMC board is very, very good at creating a great time a good party, opportunities for renewal and reflection. So please join us for that. Thanks. Yeah, I encourage you. I encourage you to um, see whether or not you can find a way um, because sometimes there are just other ways to do it, asking your parents to be able to help you, things like that. 
um, to be able to support you and to support your staff. And so um, I encourage you this week to just think out how to find a way to be able to make that possible. Absolutely. And if finances are a problem, please email me. We'll try to work with you in some way and come up with some creative ways. So please, please don't let that be the obstacle. And uh, Cindy won't say this, but Cindy and Val Weiser are, are two, co two of our co-keynotes. That's so true. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah. <laughs> but before we, we wrap up, I want to I wanna say that I've seen many dedicated members of our community. I'm looking at Dr. Andrea Durate, who's clearly in the hospital. Yes. Um, yes, Andrea shared that she, yeah, we, go ahead, Tim. Well, I, I don't know how you are or why you're there, but just know we see you, we love you, God bless you. Sending lots of healing energy your way. Yeah, absolutely. So Thank you so much. I had a heart attack on Tuesday. Oh. Oh. Ventricular tachycardia attack. Wow. And um, I'm just trying to heal. <laughs> well, We're so glad to, to see you and for you to be here. I, I wouldn't miss it, Cindy. I, I love this series. I've been using a lot of your um, recommendations in my teaching in the culturally diverse society class at the college, and it's been phenomenal. <clears throat> it's opened many college students' minds about racism and uh, different ways to approach even our little small children in the classroom. I do thank you, and I thank Tim and the foundation for all of this work. Thank you. And, and that just speaks to the ripple effect, right, of this work. There we go. You know, it goes out to the students in the classroom, to the teacher education programs, to the university students. So uh, I think, you know, that just speaks to that we, we can make a difference, um, even as a small group, uh, as it goes out into, yeah. into all the schools and classrooms. Andre, you have an extended family. If you're laying there and you're bored, Call any one of us and we'll be happy to happy sit to tonight with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks everybody. We will see you uh, next Thank week. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.